Hi. Today we're going to be taking a very quick look at an interesting fader from the early 2000s, the Eckler Eternal Fader. If you don't know much about faders or DJ equipment, however, I suggest you watch at least the start of my video about the Vestac Samurai Fader, as it goes over some basic concepts that we'll be expanding upon today. Click the link in the whatchamacallit. Anyway, in this case, the Eternal Fader is installed inside an Eckler Hack 360 mixer, which my friend Giles has very kindly lent me. Check out his show on EHFM, I'll give you a link below, but the Fader was also available as an upgrade for a number of other Eckler mixers, including the Neo series. The Hack series was part of a new wave of battle mixers that challenged Vestax's dominance at the turn of the millennium and used novel Fader technology. It was quite popular in the European turntablist scene, whereas the other popular mixer around at the time, the Rain TTM56 with its magnetic fader, was most popular in America. Anyway, like the Vestax Samurai fader, the Eckler Eternal makes use of inductive technology, but in a completely different way from the Samurai. Let's take a look. Dismantling it is as simple as removing two screws from the sides, and then the circuit board assembly can be simply slid out. The wiper is very interesting. It seems to have a plate made of metal attached to it, similar to the Vestac Samurai, but unlike the Samurai, the metal is not ferromagnetic, meaning a magnet won't stick to it, so I suppose it must be made of aluminium. Another thing that sets this thing apart from the Samurai is that the plate is glued to what is a very standard looking short bodied fader mechanism, almost identical to what you'd find in a mini inno fader or cheaper carbon potentiometers like the RA series from Alpha or the PTF series from Boo Urns. It's a bit weird that a fader of this size is such a small mechanism, but I suppose it contributes to the fader's reputation for feeling extremely light. Though I know the Eternal has its fans, and it certainly doesn't feel bad, personally I prefer heavier faders like the full-size Inno Fader and the Pro X Fade. Anyway, the circuit board assembly actually consists of three circuit boards sandwiched together and joined using a standard pin header. The aluminium wiper slides in between two of these circuit boards but doesn't actually touch them, so the position sensing components must be on these two boards. Talking of circuit boards, this video is sponsored by PCBWay, who very kindly got in touch to offer their services and you can find a link to in the video description. New members get $5 off their first order, basically making it free, and assembly services can be had for as little as $30. I have some very exciting projects coming up that use PCBWay's services extensively, so get subscribed and notified if you don't want to miss those. Dismantling the assembly shows that these boards each have two grey pieces of metal attached to them, which fit into cut-out slots in the board and have been glued into place. Shining a light through one of the boards reveals that there are traces going in a spiral pattern around the centre of the metal piece. All these elements together form a device called a planar transformer. To explain how this works, I'll need to briefly explain what an electrical transformer is. Basically, it's a device that converts electrical energy into magnetic energy, then back into electrical energy again, but often at a different voltage from the original electrical supply. They're very commonly used in power supplies to convert 110 or 220 volt mains electricity down to, for example, 5 volts for USB devices. Transformers in their most basic form consist of two lengths of wire wound around a metal core. When electrical energy is applied to one of the windings, a magnetic field forms in the metal core. This in turn creates electrical energy in the other winding. If the second winding has fewer turns than the first winding, then the voltage in the second winding will be lower than the first winding and vice versa. This is how power supply transformers work. In the case of planar transformers, like in the Eckler Eternal, the windings are made of spiral traces on a circuit board rather than coils of wire, but the principle is identical. According to the Eckler Eternal service manual, each circuit board has six layers and the windings are on the inner four layers. But the unusual thing about these transformers is that they have been effectively split in half, with one half being on one circuit board and the other half being on the other. This will still work as a transformer because there is no need for the two halves of the core to be physically connected, as magnetic fields can travel through air. But this construction is what allows the transformers to detect the position of the fader wiper. You see, the aluminium wiper is able to slide in between the two halves of this transformer. When this happens, it stops the magnetic energy travelling between the two halves and therefore will reduce the output voltage of the secondary winding. We can examine this effect on an oscilloscope. At the top in yellow we have the voltage going into the transformer, which is in the form of a 180 kHz sine wave. The bottom pink wave is the output from the transformer. As you can see, the more of the transformer is blocked by the wiper, the lower the output voltage is. There are two of these transformers in the Eternal Fader, one at each end. I've hooked up the other transformer now and it appears in blue. You can see that as I move the wiper from one end to the other, the relative voltage on each transformer changes. By examining these voltages, the mixer can determine exactly where the wiper is along the fader travel. I'm not 100% sure of the physics involved here, but as I understand it, the reason the magnetic fields are being blocked is because a type of electrical energy known as eddy currents are being induced in the wiper, and that generates an opposing magnetic field that cancels out the input field. 
I'll give you a link to a paper down below that explains this principle in more details. Now, although the wiper is made of aluminium, which is a non-ferromagnetic material, I don't believe this is important for it to work as a shield. My understanding is that any conductive metal should work if placed perpendicular to the magnetic field lines, regardless of whether or not it's ferromagnetic. Actually, that gives me an idea. I suspect Eckler chose aluminium because it's relatively lightweight and this is one of the selling points of the Eternal Fader. Or perhaps they were concerned with the wiper becoming magnetised and messing up the measurements. I'm open to suggestions here. Anyway, now we know the physical principle behind how the fader operates, let's find out how the electronics work. The Eternal Service Manual has a very detailed description of the circuit, so I won't go into too much detail, but I'll give a quick summary of what each section does. This section generates a 180kHz square wave, which is filtered by these components here to turn it into a sine wave. This wave is then sent to the primary primary transformer windings here. Then, at the other end of the transformer, the output voltage of the secondary windings are rectified with this section here. This outputs a DC voltage level proportional to the amplitude of the sine wave at the transformer. This is then fed into this differential amplifier, which outputs the difference between the two voltages. If you look on the scope again, I've got the two rectified voltages in yellow and blue, and you can see that the output voltage in pink swings from positive to negative as the two input voltages change relative to each other. This voltage representing the fader position is then sent to the mixer, which can use it to fade the two channels relative to each other. What fun. So I guess that's the fader pretty much sussed out. I might take a closer look at the actual mixer in more detail at another time, but despite being extremely well designed and just generally being a great mixer, I don't think there's anything particularly special about the electronics. Not that that's a bad thing, less is more for battle mixers, and being honest I think I prefer it to the rain mixers that were around at the same time. Well that's it for this video, but thanks very much for watching, and get subscribed and notified if you want to see more DJ equipment and retro computing videos. Cheers!